thank you all for coming out. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to kind of uh, get together, get out to um, have a public uh, session on this and give everybody a chance to uh, ask some questions. Want to cover um, a couple of things here. First of all, let me introduce who's here. Um, first of all, you're here, so thank you very much. And I realize there's some weather being expected tonight. Let's hope that um, it starts after we're all here and ends before we all leave. So we're safe on that front. Um, obviously, my name is Mike Tetro. I'm first selectman. We have um, on my far left uh, Meg Harvey from the Connecticut Department of Health. Uh, next to me on my left is Sands Cleary, our Director of Health. On my right is Jim Olson from Tie and Bond. That's our licensed environmental professional who's working with us on both uh, reviewing and evaluating the test results that come back and when needed helping develop a re remediation plan for any of the sites that uh, come up positive. And then Brian Carey, uh, who right now is filling two roles, both our conservation director and our interim uh, superintendent of public works. Uh, as a, uh, our goal here is to give a brief introduction, uh, step through where we are, uh, what the plans are uh, as we, or steps are as we go through remediation and what the best practices are for that. Uh, and then I'm going to go through and, and give a little bit of background in terms of uh, kind of how we got here. Uh, with that as an intro, here's what we thought we'd do on ground, uh, ground rules. Uh, we want to make sure all the questions get answered. Uh, we were, we're expect this is a good sized crowd, we're expecting a, uh, more folks will be coming in. Uh, we want to make sure that um, folks have a chance to get their questions answered. Uh, we'll be here as long as we need to to answer all the questions. We're asking everybody to write them down. Some folks have been good enough to write those ahead of time. Uh, Rose, Judy, can you raise your hands? Rose and Judy have notepads, uh, note cards rather, and pens for anybody who wants to write a question down. And uh, they will collect them and bring them up to Brian Carey, who'll kind of uh, hand them down to us on the panel. We'll read out the question and then kind of direct it to whoever makes the most sense to answer it, or more than one person, if that's appropriate. And do a, a few remarks here, but um, one of the first questions, just to get this out, uh, with this format, why are you not allowed the taxpayers to speak and ask questions? Uh, we set it up to allow, uh, to make sure that all the questions do get answered on a timely fashion and everybody hears them. Uh, we'll certainly be staying around, we'll have more of these sessions. Um, we wanna make sure all the questions get answered. From the top, um, we recognize there are a lot of questions out there, and that's why we're holding this session. Uh, we've tried to set up a format uh, that we've set up for the last couple weeks. One, that we're getting press releases out with the information we have and with the test results as we identify what's taken place. Two, we set up a web page uh, on the town website uh, at www.fairfieldct dot org slash fill use issues. We're going to keep all the relevant information there to make sure that uh, even if you missed today's press release uh, or today's test results, there's some place where all that information is kept so you can go back and look at that at any point. And we do expect, um, Sands will get into this a little bit more, but roughly we've identified uh, last Friday, 20 sites. We expect those to be tested this week as a time frame, uh, and we expect the results to come back within a couple days after that. Uh, Sands will cover that in a little bit more detail. As we step through this, uh, just to be clear, uh, my first priority is public safety. So we're focusing our resources on understanding what town fields, parks, and other public areas received fill from the Julian pile between 2013 and 2016. Testing those sites and quickly remediating those that need it uh, is a top priority. Our next priority, which is already underway, is to understand how all this happened and to take the steps necessary to make sure this does not get repeated. On this, I want to be very clear. It's an apparent that decisions were made and actions taken by some within a public works department 
that were not in the public interest. Separate and apart from the ongoing criminal investigation, the public trust was violated and public health was put at risk. Regardless of how great or small that risk is, it is still a breach of the public trust. And I will not tolerate such conduct in our town government. With regard to the testing and remediation plans, every decision we make is guided by science, best practices, and the law. Our first step in our process is to understand where the fill from the aggregate pile was used between 2013 and 2016 on any town sites. As we determine that, we test the sites in accordance with guidance from our licensed environmental professional. Uh, we'll use the term LEP or acronym LEP to refer to that, as well as the State Department of Health, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, also known as DEEP, uh, and our own health department. When needed, we'll work with Ty and Bond our LEP, uh, as well as DEEP and the Department of Health in developing a re remediation action plan for each specific site. We'll carry out that remediation plan as quickly as possible and we'll reopen a site once we are satisfied that the site is safe. Uh, with that as a brief intro, I'm going to turn the mic over to Sands Cleary, our Director of Health, to step through an update on exactly where we are. Uh, and what our testing is. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Um, I hope to address all, all your questions that you have for me tonight. Um, so uh, August 6th, we received a DEP spill report um, that we received those routinely throughout the week, mostly their underground storage tanks being removed, gas station spills, car accidents where fluids are, are released. This one notified us of some uh, asbestos with, with possible PCBs and lead at Gould Manor Park. Uh, so I went out and took a look just to see, and it said still on site. I went out and took a look at see at the park, didn't see any activity, um, and noticed in the contact for on the form said, you know, Detective Hine. So I contacted Detective Hine, and he made me aware of uh, that day that um, he received a complaint uh, regarding asbestos shingles. Uh, and was having D reported that to DEP, and they were coming down the following day to do some testing. So that's really how it, it started for our department and for the, the, the town side here. Um, so um, with that, uh, DEP did come down um, on um, the 7th uh, and conducted testing. Um, we, we were at the site, uh, the health department uh, was there, and several town staff were there along with police and, and several others. So. Um, the, uh, the, the following day, we met with a licensed environmental professional at the site from Ty and Bond, uh, Jim Olson, um, and in conjunction with um, consulting with the police to make sure we weren't interfering with any kind of um, aspects of the criminal investigation, we requested that we be allowed to do an interim control. We did, when we, when we became aware of this and we went down to the site, uh, we did see the asbestos shingle pieces. Uh, we did see that on the surface there. So we uh, requested uh, of police uh, and of uh, tie and bond that, uh, that we do an interim measure of picking up every visible piece that we could find and that was done um, the following day. Um, and then um, essentially we, we um, that was our interim control measure. We consulted with Department of Public Health and DEP and asked about if there's any additional interim controls that they would recommend and there were no interim controls to be uh, recommended um, that, that they felt that given what we've done already, that was sufficient. So we moved forward with waiting for the test results. Um, and at the same time, we started developing a list of other sites where this uh, fill from the fill pile could have been used. Uh, that included consulting with Fairfield Public Schools right away, uh, consulting with uh, Parks and Rec and with the Department of Public Works, with police, uh, and, uh, and also it, it turned out with our finance department to work out some of the invoices to help us to figure out uh, what, was, what was purchased from Julian. Um, so, then we got to the, uh, our initial results back. Um, DEP collected 10 samples. Um, nine of those were soil samples. Eight were, were what's called composite samples where they collect a bunch of samples, they combine them and they sample that. One was a grab sample where it's a single location and one was pieces of those shingle pieces from the surface. Um, those results came back with the, uh, the uh, 
that, that, that first round of testing was called a toxicity characteristic leachate procedure test, we'll call it T-clip. That T-clip test tells you whether it's the materials found there are hazardous waste. When we got the results back, none of the materials were deemed hazardous waste. Um, we did not find any asbestos fibers in the soil. Uh, we did, it did confirm that the shingle pieces themselves uh, were asbestos, but were deemed non-friable asbestos. So that's a, 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 most of you are probably familiar, familiar with those transite type of shingles, but it's a small percentage of asbestos and it's all in, in mostly other material. It's very hard, very hard to break, does not give off fibers readily. Um, so that, but that was positive for asbestos. Um, what we then requested um, was what's called a mass analysis of the, of the uh, data, which uh, gives us um, a different set of uh, results that allows us to determine whether it, uh, the elements there, the constituents within there, meet uh, any levels of direct expo what's called direct exposure criteria. That those, that's the health and safety standards. So we requested that additional testing be done, um, and, and that, was, um, that was performed. Uh, at the same time, uh, that, that week, Tyan Bond was collecting additional samples uh, that would allow us to uh, more def better define where any contamination at Gould Manor Park was. Um, so that's more of a scientific grid type of methodology where you're looking exactly where things are, how deep they go, how wide it goes. Uh, and so that's what they were working on at that point. Um, in addition, uh, we're in, in, in continuous communication with DPH and DEP and our consultant about are there additional recommendations, are there any other protective measures we should be taking? Um, given the constituents that we knew of at that time, um, th there were no additional recommendations made. Um, the second set of results did come back positive uh, for a couple items. There was uh, four samples, four of the samples came back with levels of arsenic that are above the residential standard. So the resident residential standard is 10 parts per million. Um, these samples came back ranging from 10.8 to 15.2. Um, arsenic can be a naturally occurring uh, um, element in the soil. Uh, can range in Connecticut anywhere from zero to up to 40 parts per million is very typical to, to find in Connecticut. So this is, uh, in our consultation with DPH, they described it as a marginal exceedance. Um, uh, that, that, uh, so in addition, one of those samples did come back positive for lead above that direct exposure criteria. That direct exposure criteria is 400 parts per million. Um, the level that we found was 506 in that particular sample, uh, one of the samples. Um, and again, that was in consultation with DPH viewed as a marginal exceedance. You can find lead in soil uh, up to extremely high levels, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, parts per million. Um, and uh, so with that information, um, we uh, were waiting for some of the additional sample results from, uh, from Tyan Bond. But we also, in the initial report, we said we found some barium, uh, not above hazardous waste standards, but in our second um, mass analysis, the barium was found to be well below the direct exposure criteria uh, levels, uh, you know, to order of hundreds of times below that. Um, so, um, so again, we, uh, again, in consultation with DPH, our consultant, um, Tyan Bond and DEP, looked at what, what do we need to do next. Um, and so, um, at the same time, we, we distributed our priority sites. And, and to talk about how those were selected, it was, you know, we, we as soon as I said before, we mentioned to Fairfield Public uh, Schools, to Parks and Rec, and to Public Works, we started working on what, what sites typically received uh, or could have received the, some of the products down there that may have potentially been contaminated. And so that's, we started that list. We developed um, uh, a numerous sites. We prioritized 20 sites that were um, schools and you know, it seemed to be that the soccer fields seemed to receive annual maintenance by public works at times during that period. Um, there were some emails about soccer fields getting some extensive renovations in 2015. Um, and so we put those on the list and we, you know, the information we received from, um, from the rec department about all their different soccer fields, we conferred with um, 
public works if they brought stuff, uh, material to those sites. And the typical type of activity when we say they're bringing material to that site, for most of the sites, it was um, they were leveling out the field in the areas where the goalies were would get some uh, uh, some degradation, they get pitted there, and they would they would scrape off the topsoil and the, the the sod. They would fill it in a little bit. They'd use what was there to level it. If they needed to bring more in, they'd put in some fill and some topsoil, and they'd either sod it over if it was during the season, or they'd plant grass if they had time to, if it was off season and the grass had time to grow. Um, so every site uh, that was a park or a ball field or a school um, that we confirmed from Public Works that yes, we put fill from the fill pile on that site uh, became our priority areas. So that's, that's the 20 list, list of 20 sites that we're currently testing now. Um, a, a few days later, uh, this week, um, actually today, we received our initial results from Tyne Bond sampling. They did 40 samples uh, throughout the entire area at Gould Manor Park. Um, of those, they were essentially they were relatively consistent with what the uh, DEP tests revealed. Three of them uh, came back above the direct exposure criteria levels for uh, lead. Uh, again, marginal exceedances. Um, no PCBs were detected, no petroleum hydrocarbons, no asbestos fibers in the soil, uh, but the shingle pieces that they did find uh, did come back in the same way as the DEP results, positive for non-friable asbestos. And so that's currently where we are with Gould Manor with the schools. Um, all the sampling uh, at the schools should have been wrapped up. Jim can share that a little bit more. We were trying to get all the schools done yesterday and today and get those sample results sent off. We are sampling the remaining uh, items on the list uh, tomorrow and Friday. We will be getting those results in stages as they, as they become available. It's usually a 48 to 72 hour turnaround on the sample results. So we have to hope to have some initial sample results at the end of this week. Uh, and then some earlier, some other, the, the remaining ones at some point next, early next week. And so that's what we are uh, shooting for. And that's sort of the, 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 where we are right now. So I'll hand it back to you, Mike. I think next up, we'd like to hear a little bit from Meg Harvey in terms of uh, the State Department of Health, what their perspective is and what guidance they are giving the town. Good evening. Good evening, every, everyone. Uh, my name again is Meg Harvey, um, and I'm sure I'm a new face to all of you, um, but I have actually been at the State Health Department, uh, Department of Public Health uh, in Hartford for 19 years now, working in um, the environmental health section. And in particular, the unit I work in, um, we provide really just advice, consultation, recommendations, to primarily town health departments, uh, health directors in towns all over Connecticut where there are environmental uh, contaminants, environmental toxins in the environment, and people have questions about public health, about their exposure, about risks. And the unit that I'm in has no regulations. I administer no regulations. Um, there are other groups at the health department that do. For example, the asbestos program has uh, a lot of regulations, but my unit really is um, scientific consultation, technical assistance uh, to, uh, to towns. Um, and we, I know you just heard uh, a lot of um, chemical names thrown around, numbers, concentrations, parts per million, um, et cetera. And um, my goal, uh, hopefully, uh, I will achieve that goal, is to get all your questions answered uh, tonight about what are these chemicals, what do they mean. Um, I, and I have been working with Sands closely over the past couple of weeks since he first reached out um, to, to us to share the information that there had um, they had discovered that there was uh, this, this fill at Gould Manor Park that was not clean soil. Um, and what, you know, what, what, do, what do we do? Um, what is the best public health approach uh, to take? And um, the important things to kind of keep in mind, I think, when you hear the chemical names and concentrations, et cetera, and standards and, you know, um, marginally above standard or below standard, 
the, the, the thing to keep in mind, the most important thing is um, the concept of exposure. And, and no matter what the chemical or the concentration that's in the environment, unless you have contact with it, unless you come into contact and that chemical actually gets into your body, there's no exposure. And if there's no exposure, there's no concern for health risk. So that's kind of no, number one overarching um, thing to keep in mind. The second thing is even if there is exposure, even if you do come into contact with chemical in the environment, in this situation we're talking about chemicals in soil, if you come into contact with the chemical and some of it does get into your body, yes, you're exposed. But that does not necessarily mean that you will have a health risk or a health symptom. Exposure does not necessarily mean health risk or health symptom or worry for health. In order to get to that point where we're actually worried about a health risk or health symptoms, you have to have enough of the chemical, a lot of the chemical, getting into your body. And that usually has to happen with many repeated exposures over a long period of time to chemicals that are present at high levels in the environment. So going back now to what we know about the condition of the soil that was placed at Gould Manor Park, obviously the, the, the data that we have tell us that that soil is not clean soil. That soil has material in it, chemicals in it that are not typical background. Um, Yes, sometimes we, you know, we see levels of arsenic. Arsenic could be background. Lead, yes, you'd never expect it to be zero. But um, pieces of asbestos-containing shingles, no, that's not normal. That's not background. And, and the levels of lead are more than what we would typically consider background. Um, so when we now, we have chemicals and levels, what do we use to compare them against? So, the, the, really the only standards we have, public health standards for soil, are our residential cleanup standards for direct contact with that soil. Um, we don't have standards for parks, for recreation, that type of, of exposure, that type of contact. So we use residential. Now, we all know that the you know, the, the strip of grass next to the sidewalk at the park is not residential. Um, people are not living there. Um, so when we say the levels of lead and arsenic in the soil were a little bit above our residential standards, that is not a concern at all in terms of health risk because the way we come up with our residential standards, we assume a lot of soil exposure. We assume young children, as young as age one, coming into direct contact with this, that soil while playing in their yard, directly in the dirt, lots of hand-to-mouth contact, that that activity occurs seven days a week, 365 days per year, and the kids are eating a decent amount of soil through incidental contact every day. That type of exposure we know is not occurring um, uh, at the park. So these are all the sort of the things that I went through in my discussions with SANS and in my analysis of, of looking at the data. In addition, we're not dealing with bare soil. Grass is a great barrier between people and soil. Um, just as you know, if kids go out and they're playing in a, in a grassy field, um, they'll come back with grass stains on their knees, whereas if they're out playing on a field with no grass, they will come back with dirt stains on their knees. So the grass really um, does provide a good barrier from that, from that direct contact um, with the soil. So, you know, numerous conversations, um, uh, you know, over the past week or so, and um, my recommendations were that really nothing needed to be done immediately with that um, soil around the sidewalk, um, given the, the type of activity that happens there and the concentrations. But the town decided um, that they really wanted to kind of take an extra step and be 
um, extra protective and, and really, um, uh, you know, try to take every action that, um, that would further reduce even, you know, the most remote possibility that, that people could come into contact with that soil. And I think they're going to be doing um, fencing, I believe, kind of fencing, fencing off a little bit to help, um, to help uh, further reduce any possibility that people come into contact with that soil. And then as we move forward um, and get additional results from the additional um, fields that are going to be tested, I will continue to uh, look at those results and, um, and give advice and consultation um, to, uh, to the town. Okay. Thank you, Meg. Um, just want to point out, if anybody needs a card or pen, uh, Judy's going around handing out cards or collecting questions. And where's Rose? Rose is over there. And, and uh, if you let uh, her know, she will uh, also get you a card or pen as we go through. Uh, next up is Jim Olson uh, from Ty and Bond, who's going to talk about our approach to remediation. Good evening. Again, I'm Jim Olson. I'm a uh, licensed environmental professional, or LEP, from Ty and Bond. Um, as an LEP, um, I'm charged with investigating and remediating sites, um, overseeing them and, and signing off on them uh, by the uh, Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. I have over 30 years of experience uh, working in the state. Um, the town of Fairfield brought us in um, last week. I personally visited the Gould Manor Park on Wednesday and our teams were down there Thursday and Friday and doing an investigation. Um, I think the SANS explained what we did previously. Um, so when we collected our data, we compare it to the uh, remediation standard regulations, which Meg explained. And uh, we worked with the town on developing interim measures to prevent contact. And we're also right now working on a remedial action plan for that area. Um, so we're making good progress on that site. Um, <clears throat> regarding the, the other 20 um, prioritized sites, about half of those are schools. Um, we started um, uh, evaluating those sites in a three-step process. Um, one, we went out to the sites and visually observed the sites. Um, I personally was at all uh, <laughs> 10 of the school sites. Uh, we looked at the ground surface. Uh, we met with the Department of Public Works and, 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 and visited the site, observed where the fill was reportedly used. Uh, we, we sampled those areas. Um, uh, as of today, we've completed all the um, nine or 10 school sites and we will complete the remaining sites by the end of the week. Um, so the three step process is one, we investigate them. Two, once the data comes in from our laboratory and the data is on a 24 to 48 hour turnaround, um, we evaluate the data and to see if there's any exceedances of the remediation uh, standard regulations. Um, if there's not, you know, we, we deem those areas safe. If there is, um, we, we look at the levels and then we work with the town to say what type of interim measure should be taken to protect the, the users of those fields. It can be things such as um, snow fencing, uh, geotextiles, mulch. It really depends on the site and you know where the impacts are located and what's there already for uh, cover. As Meg indicated previously, you know grass in itself is a, is a pretty good barrier. So that. That's step two of the interim measures, and step three, if the site does need uh, cleanup, uh, we'll work to develop a remedial action plan. Um, and probably most of the sites, well, not most, well, any site that needs some kind of cleanup will be excavations, materials, uh, replacement with clean fill, and removal of the, um, the impacted materials for offsite disposal at a licensed facility. Oh, thank you. Um, one, um, I want to get through a little bit of uh, history here to kind of put this in perspective, uh, just so we kind of see uh, kind of what's taken place over time. Uh, this started back in 2013 when Public Works wanted to try a new approach in terms of, of helping us, uh, helping the town get uh, the material, about 40,000 cubic yards. It's in the Public Works uh, work yard, or Public Works yard as we call it, uh, down. So they set out an RFP, developed uh, between Public Works and Purchasing to bring a contractor on. Uh, previously, there had been a part-time contractor come in, but it wasn't really working for Public Works because they weren't sure when the yard was open or not, uh, and that impacted their ability to plan work. 
So the idea, they thought, came up with the idea to put a full-time uh, contractor in there to run the yard. So that started in about 2013. It was a uh, three-year, uh, approximately, uh, purchase order or tour. Um, I started to hear about the problems in the yard, specifically in the January, February 2016 time period. Uh, got a number of calls from neighbors talking about the pile continuing to grow rather than getting worked down as we, we had planned on it. Um, starting with that, I sat down with Public Works and said, we've got to get this down. So we set up a system where, where we would track weekly, and I was updated every week from March uh, through the end of the year on what material was, the amount of material moving in to the yard and the amount of material moving out of the yard. Uh, and every week, that showed that there was more material moving out than moving in. So if those numbers were accurate, the pile should have been getting s smaller over those time periods. In addition, uh, in order to help better communicate with the neighborhood, we set up a series of meetings uh, that in many cases were almost monthly. We also set up uh, email updates that went out every two weeks uh, to the neighbors that uh, wanted to be on that. Uh, so that's what we started doing and tracking it literally every week and every month reporting back to the neighbors. We set up a web page, again, to hold all that information. And that was the, uh, you may have heard about the, uh, it's fairfieldct.org slash pwyard for Public Works Yard. That is still up. It's got almost three years worth of monthly reports and charts and presentations that we made to the neighborhood. Um, that summer, uh, frankly, that the complaints were not uh, moved from just about the size of the pile to, uh, to the truck noise, uh, both as we put pressure on Julian to um, move the aggregate out of there and get the pile down. But at the same time, the construction of the regional fire training facility was going on and Penfield Pavilion. So there are three major projects all right in the neighborhood, which created a tremendous amount of traffic on Reef Road. As we move forward uh, in September, uh, the pile wasn't coming down fast enough. So I told Julian, that's it. And once this contract is over on December 15th, we are not going to renew it. Uh, that would do two, two things. One, give us a chance to reassess where the pile was and what approach we use going forward. It also would bring to win in the truck traffic going into the pile. It would bring the fire training facility was going to be done about then and Penfield Pavilion major work was going to be done about then. So that would cut down the truck traffic on Reef Road, which was causing major concern for the neighborhood. At that time, in talking with the neighbors, there was a concern raised about, well, what if they leave any contaminated soil here? What if this? What if that? So we said, as part of our shutdown process starting in September, uh, I instructed Public Works to bring in a licensed environmental professional not Mr. Olson's firm, but another one, to randomly test the soil over that time period. And they did that uh, from there uh, till uh, late December. In October, we also heard about bond issues um, from a, another town that used Julian Services. And we, I had purchasing check, and it turns out the bond they put forth as part of the RFP wasn't valid. It was from a company that wasn't licensed to do bonds in Connecticut. So we immediately checked every bond we have out for every company to make sure that the bonds we have are valid everywhere else, and they were. I then sat down with purchasing and said, look, I want to go back and review this uh, and see exactly what happened with our bidding process. What did we miss? And how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? We don't want to be in this situation. How do we go back and identify the issues that have come up and make sure we validate every single one of those on every bid going forward so that we stop any uh, problems like this from cropping up again. And we did that in October of 2016. On November 29th, our LEP was on site at approximately 6.30 in the morning, saw three Julian trucks come in, drive, in essence, around the pile, away from where the work was being done, and dump their loads. She then went over to that and sampled that material. Two weeks later, the test came back on December 13th, 
saying that material was contaminated with PCBs and high levels of lead. That is material that was never supposed to get on in our town at all, uh, and certainly not uh, being brought in by Julian uh, to contaminate the soil there. We shut down the site that day. We literally brought a police officer down with our town attorney and our public works uh, officials and kicked Julian off, parked a big dump truck in front of the gate to make sure nothing moved from there and all their equipment was quarantined on the site. We called DEEP and a representative from DEEP came down that afternoon to survey what was taking place and provide guidance. We were told to come up with a re remediation plan by a licensed environmental professional, which we did. We then went back to the site in a February timeframe to determine the extent of the contamination and that, so the area that was uh, the scene, source of the dumping was then tested uh, and ex excavated. That soil was removed uh, until there were no longer any testing uh, for PCBs and lead that showed up to those levels. So that the uh, pile, on one hand, the pile itself, the material in it, the aggregate, uh, is not what's called clean material. But the idea was that we were mixing it, the 40,000 cubic yards was part of our street sweepings, had come from our storm drains and some of our public works projects, some of the spoils from those projects. The idea was to bring in cleaner soil, mix it, so it could be used in certain construction applications. Uh, it met the uh, levels for industrial commercial use. Not residential, not ballparks, but industrial commercial use. So it might be something, as we did, we used it in the berm, and that's an appropriate use for that material. As we cleaned that up, and it was spent about $300,000 to do that, we asked Julian to pay for that. They refused. So we took them to court, and that lawsuit is ongoing. It's currently in arbitration. In addition, in talking with Mr. Kerry, um, Brian pointed out that there may be some laws broken in terms of them transporting that level of contaminated soil to our site and dumping it there. That you need licenses to do that, and you have to know what you're, you're doing, and you have to have permits to move that. Um, I then contacted our police chief, uh, Chief McNamara, and asked him to investigate that to see if any laws were broken at the state or federal level uh, and whether Julian could, should be held responsible for that. Also in 2017, uh, we continued to meet with the neighbors. We brought in a landscape architect to design a berm. We got approvals from conservation, uh, planning and zoning, uh, and DEEP to help design this berm and make sure that um, it did the appropriate things, both shielded the neighborhood, uh, but also protected uh, the creek uh, and everybody else. Uh, in 2018, uh, the spring of 2018, primarily March through June, the berm itself was constructed. It, of the, uh, we determined once Julian got off site, there was, instead of 40,000 cubic yards, there was closer to 100,000 cubic yards of material on site. 40,000 of that, almost half, we used in the construction of the berm around the public works yard. Every single part of that was tested before we used it. Uh, not only to protect the environment, but also to protect our public works employees who were building the berm. So we did that with uh, a licensed environmental professional to make sure that the soil we were using met the standards for commercial and industrial use and it was appropriate for the berm. So all 40,000 cubic yards we tested passed that standard. Then we come to 2019 where there was a search and seizure warrant issued uh, by the state's attorney office against Julian while the police had gone on for almost two years on this investigation, they do not give updates. They don't update the police commission. They don't update my office. Uh, that is all confidential information. So this was the first update 
a very public update, but the first update uh, so what taken place, and there was uh, backup to that search and seizure warrant uh, that identified some very concerning uh, issues with the operation of our public works department. Um, coming out of that, uh, I placed Scott Bartlett on administrative leave. A couple weeks later, uh, arrest warrants were issued with affidavits, and the affidavits are about 30 pages each going on with each warrant and they detail some further um, information. There were three individuals arrested, uh, Jason Julian uh, from Julian Enterprises, Scott Bartlett from our Public Works, and Joe Michelangelo from our Public Works. Uh, this was the first we had heard of that taking place, um, and I did place Joe Michelangelo on leave about that time. Uh, about the same time, there was a complaint from a neighbor to the police about asbestos on Ghoul Manor Park. Our police department took that to Deep directly, and Deep came down on a Wednesday, I believe, uh, August 7th, that Sands referenced earlier, to uh, test the soil along the sidewalk. Uh, Sands, uh, they did, did notify our Department of Health, so Sands was able to join down there. And that same day, we hired uh, Ty and Bond, uh, Jim Olson's company, to be on board, so whatever the test came back with, we were ready uh, to make sure we could start remediation procedures right away. In conjunction with DEEP, the Department of Health, and Ty and Bond, uh, we looked at the materials that came back, and as, as San said, they didn't rise to the level of um, hazardous waste material, and that's a level defined by the um, EPA. But they did come back with some contaminants, and we did identify shingles. The next step was refining testing uh, on the pile to get a, a better profile of the site and know what we needed to do from a remediation standpoint. Uh, we identified uh, other sites within town. Along with that, once we found out that fill from the pile was being used at other sites, um, and up until now, uh, we didn't have visibility on that taking place. Certainly, somebody in public works had made the decisions that was uh, to move some of that and use it on our parks and ball fields. But let's be clear, this is soil aggregate, it's material that's at the commercial industrial level. Uh, as uh, Ms. Harvey pointed out, that is not the residential level. That should not be used on ball fields and parks. And if I have to pick a major violation of trust, that's where that happened. That shouldn't have happened at all. That's not appropriate and should never have taken place. Um, we identified 20 sites uh, initially. Uh, as Sands pointed out, we're matching up invoices with public works tickets, with locations, and the type of fill that was used. Uh, the testing, as we said, is going to be done by the end of this week. The re results were available within 48 hours. And we're still matching some invoices to make sure that we didn't miss any other sites and there are other locations out there uh, that we may in fact have to test. Um, and last Friday, I did terminate Scott Bartlett. We're looking at, um, kind of, as Sam said, as of today, the tests are back. Uh, Ty and Bond is uh, reviewing those. They did their additional sampling. We have identified we're going to have to remediate. We have uh, asked uh, Public Works to uh, create either a fence or other barrier around that site to keep everybody off uh, that uh, sampling. And we're obviously getting out to the neighborhood. We've got tonight's meeting. We'll have another meeting tomorrow night, and we'll schedule two more after that. So we will keep updates coming probably every other day or so to keep everybody updated. We'll both email those out, post those on the Facebook page, and get those on our uh, web page so that we have full transparency in terms of how we're moving through this. As I said, this material should never have been used in parks and recs, uh, the parks and rec site. Uh, as of today, because the Ghoul Manor site tested positive and we expect comparable material, we don't know until we test it, but we, it came from the same pile, so we're expecting a comparable profile. Uh, we've closed uh, the parks uh, and fields where uh, we've identified as part of those 20. The Board of Ed also took the same step on the school fields. 
As I said, the testing's underway. We're getting the results back as quickly as we can. We are going to remediate, and we're going to make sure these fields are safe. Uh, we're also reviewing what took place, what do we have to do to, to um, strengthen our reporting, uh, and specifically, uh, let me give one example of, of what we're doing and, and are putting in place in the next couple of days. As I went through and read the affidavits, and as much as some of those are allegations and still need to be proved, one of the constant themes, or recurring themes, was that there were a number of employees that spoke up and weren't listened to. So we want to make sure that never happens again. So we're putting in a hotline number for our employees, an anonymous hotline number, and we're going to make it available to residents too to make sure that if anything like this is a concern, that it gets recognized at the highest levels in town and we can take action, that it doesn't get stopped at some other level and not listened to. Uh, this is very concerning. I'm really upset that anybody would do this to our town and that any town employees would be involved in this at all. And we're going to make sure that um, anybody involved in this is prosecuted to the highest extent of the law, and we're going to take whatever steps we need to do that. So with that, uh, keying that off, uh, I'm going to um, ask if there's any other questions. I think Judy's bringing some up to Brian here. I've got a handful of questions here. Uh, well, let's, yeah, let's bring those over so we just take those all one at a time. So we make sure, all right, we want to make sure we get through all of these. So starting from the top, uh, and it may be one or more of these that are appropriate for folks to uh, answer up here. So from the top, no one lives at these parks, but children are playing games, baseball, etc., multiple times a week, every week, three seasons, a year. Isn't that considered prolonged exposure? Uh, Meg, I'm going to turn that one to you, and here's the mic. So, um, pro prolonged exposure relative to our residential standards? No, that is, it's not prolonged exposure. It's still exposure, playing multiple times, mm -hmm. playing on a, uh, a ball field multiple times a week for three seasons out of the year, yes kids are going to be coming into direct contact with soil, yes. However, compared to what we assume happens in a residential setting, residential setting exposure assumptions that we make are much longer. Children starting age one and living at the same house for 30 years, being in the soil every day, seven days a week, 365 days per year, all four seasons. Those are the assumptions for direct contact with soil that are built into our residential standards. Uh, next question. Why was Sands Cleary not notified in 2014 about asbestos at Gould Manor uh, sidewalk? Mr. Tetra replied, thank you for following up 8-24-2014. Um, let me do part of that and see if, uh, Sands, I don't know if you'll have any follow-up on this. Uh, simply, uh, an email came in, I was copied on, it identified uh, there might be some asbestos uh, and material along Gould Manor sidewalk. Uh, it was directed uh, to I, either Joe Michelangelo or Scott Bartlett at the time. There was a follow-up uh, email after that that identified that the resident had met with um, Scott Bartlett uh, and appropriate uh, action was taken. Uh, and then there was a follow-up email of that saying the resident was satisfied that that was taken care of. Uh, if that material really looked like asbestos at all, it should have gone to the health department. I am not clear at all why on why it didn't, but it absolutely should have. Uh, Sam's? Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add to that other than we did not, we were not aware of this. We were not made aware of any asbestos shingles at Gould Manor during that time. Uh, we we're not aware of any, uh, the efforts that Public Works did take at the time. They did actually scrape up 
large portions of soil at the time and remove it um, and met with the complainant at the site um, and uh, you know, this is this is after the effect, after the, the effect. You know, in looking at these issues now, uh, recently, is that you know there was email communication back and forth that they met that that the individual sent an email saying thank you very much for your efforts uh, in resolving this issue, um, but at the time the health department was simply not made aware of it. You know, and we we have multiple avenues for people to to report things to us. You know, we've got all the typical social media and emails and the Q alert system and service requests through the town. So it, this one just didn't simply didn't come to us. I do want to point out that on the town website, there's a, uh, what we call uh, Q alert is the brand name, but it basically lets people uh, write in comments. It's open 724 and gets directed right to the department that they request the question of. It's been very effective over the last four or five years in, in addressing a magnitude of issues, either be they complaints or questions or requests for service uh, that go through. Next question, uh, why were there no staffing changes at DPW when the police called Scott Barlett in in October 2018 concerning the fill pile and his attorney asked the police to direct questions to that attorney? Uh, that was a step that the police did. It was part of the police investigation, uh, and they did not update anyone else in town in terms of what their questions were, what their concerns were, or that that had taken place. Next stop. Why did it take so long uh, to test the areas in question? Are these public works positions, qualifications adequate? Apparently, no one in the administration seemed to question the activities of these sites until resident complaints. Where is the oversight in this town? Um, I'm going to break this off. And perhaps, Brian, you can add a little bit as to what we do now when, when uh, uh, what it takes so long to tackle the errors in question. I think. Um, We've jumped on these as soon as the first contaminants were identified back in 2016 when we had actual data to do that uh, and moved quickly to get all that material moved off site. Uh, how are these public works been qualifications adequate? Um, we'll go back and take a look at that, but right now it's pretty simple. Working with the Department of Health and the guidelines that DEEP has uh, for these, and I'll let Brian expand a little bit on that. Um, there are strict guidelines for how this material is stored and used, right? And as long as you follow those guidelines, uh, it's appropriate. Uh, we, in this case, those guidelines were not followed. It was used on parks and ball fields, and that just should never happen. There isn't an example where that's an appropriate uh, level, and that doesn't take a whole lot of qualification. That takes uh, some basic understanding of the rules. Um, no one in this administration seemed to question the activities of these sites uh, until residents complained. It, yeah, when the pile got bigger, that's the first time and, um, that I had heard about it. Uh, and that's when I got in and set up uh, weekly updates to make sure that the pile was moving in the right direction and to make sure that, that this was front and center for our public works uh, and that we kept it in front of the neighbors. And we did that in full view and transparency for the neighbors by having monthly meetings, bi-weekly e emails, and by setting up a web page so we tracked all of our activity uh, through that time period. Uh, Brian, did you want to follow up? Um, just, uh, my name's Brian Carey. I've been the conservation director for the town since 2015, and I've just asked it recently to fill in as the interim director of public works um, for an unknown period. But just uh, to give you a little background on myself, before I started working for the town, I actually worked for the town of Stratford, started the Brownfield program over there. Um, we were able to secure about $6 million in federal funding to do remediations throughout that town. Some of you may be aware of the industrial history of Stratford, so I've had a long experience dealing with similar issues, um, a lot worse than this, actually. Um, Prior to my time in Stratford, I was actually a consultant for a multinational um, consulting firm um, doing similar work that, uh, actually exactly the same work that uh, 
Jim Olson does. So I do have experience doing um, environmental cleanup, remediation, and consulting, development of health and safety plans. Um, when this whole matter started back in December of 2016, and the fill pile was discovered by Cindy Knight, the LEP who was working at the town time for that town. During that time for the town, um, I was contacted by Joe Michelangelo because the scope of work that had turned out to be the illegal contaminated fill pile that was dumped by the Julians, um, they needed some help in kind of steering the ship at that point. Um, I immediately kind of took over the operations of the remediation and we had numerous meetings talking about that. I will tell you, there's been no material taken off that site since uh, 2016 other than what was the scope of the remediation, remediation waste at the time, which was for PCBs. There's been no PCBs detected in any of the fill we've tested so far, um, which is really a good sign. Um, again, we've talked about the low levels of materials kind of right at the the direct exposure criteria um, that has been found kind of on Gould Manor and we expect um, you know kind of similar results may probably below we've we have numerous testing results from the pile during the berm construction and all of it's been below industrial criteria um, I, I'm just going through a lot of these questions um, and a lot of them are talk about the berm um, Yep. Okay. Yep. So I'm just going to try, I'll read them one by one, but a lot of them relate to the construction berm. The question is any additional testing of the berm uh, or of the remaining pile being undertaken? The answer to that is we are uh, scheduled to put in monitoring wells along the edge of the uh, landfill, which is the pile, we'll call it the berm, pile, landfill. You know, they're all interchangeable. Um, we have a meeting with the DEP to resolve uh, a couple outstanding issues, permit issues. There was back and forth once the permit was submitted to the DEP. Um, it was kind of left in process. We will be going up there either next week or the following week to kind of dot the I's and cross the T's uh, with the permit um, for the solid waste closure of, and the construction of the berm with the DEP. That will require us to put in some monitoring wells um, that will be part of a long-term monitoring program that's required by the DEP for any solid waste closure uh, at, at, in the state. I mean, but it, specifically for this site, we will have data generated ongoing for groundwater monitoring. Um, and then, as far as uh, as far as further material, nothing is going to be taken out of that site until uh, you know we get a, a firm handle on what is going on. Um, with the pile itself, and then we'll develop protocols, and obviously that'll be a public process. Yeah, yeah, so. Why wasn't the material from the DPW yard tested before being used at schools and parks? So in talking with our other consultant from Osprey Environmental, there are records of testing that had been conducted on um, materials that were generated through our street sweeping and catch basin waste cleaning process. The DEP does allow for the reuse of those types of materials as long as the testing is being done. Um, I'm actually tr I'm in the process of getting that um, information from uh, the consultant at the moment. Um, I don't know, you know, some of the material might have been taken from the catch basin waste and street sweepings that was tested and then reused. The, obviously, the stuff that's being turned up in Gould Manor had asbestos. Uh, in it, obviously that, that probably wasn't tested. I don't know um, where that was taken from the pile, um, but there was a program in place to be testing some of the, the, the materials that the town um, generates that could be the basis of having, um, again, not hazardous waste, but Connecticut regulated waste. Yeah, I just want to be clear that, that in this, many of the applications we're talking about are applications for topsoil. Uh, this aggregate material is not uh, topsoil and should not have been used in, in those applications. So, uh, and procedures put, should have been put in place uh, from day one that kept that from happening. Then let me take this one. Why didn't the first selectman order test done five years ago when you were 
alerted by a resident that Gould Manor's soil had asbestos in it? Why didn't the first selectman order tests to be done after it was determined fill at the pile was contaminated the fields and playgrounds on the list? Uh, the second one, uh, we ordered that testing to be done as soon as we were aware that this material had been used at uh, playgrounds and ballparks because uh, it, it uh, in terms of five years ago, uh, when that uh, email came through, it was, uh, I thought, resolved by Public Works, and I assume that uh, they resolved it, and if there had been asbestos, they would have appropriately notified the health department. They didn't do that, uh, and that should have been the case. Um, but um, there's no question that they should have notified the health department on that when that came up, uh, and it should not have been um, treated the way it does. Anybody who mentions asbestos, if it goes out there and it looks like anything close to asbestos or might be, if you can't rule it out, uh, then you should at least notify the health department to have them come back and make that judgment. That judgment should not have been made by Public Works, that the site was okay and any uh, asbestos items were either not asbestos or had been removed appropriately. Uh, next up, bottom line, Mr. Tetro, you are our first selectman. Is it not your responsibility to oversee what's going on with the different departments in the town? Shouldn't the buck stop with you? Don't you go and personally check on these departments, both verbally and visually? The answer is yes, the buck stops with me. And I did have weekly meetings and did get weekly updates on what was taking place at the pile. And simply you count on uh, your trusted uh, managers to tell you the truth. If somebody's gonna be dishonest about it, uh, and give you false information, that's a challenge. Um, so no, I can't do everybody's job for them. You've got to count on your managers and directors to be doing that job. Why weren't the town employees terminated that were arrested? Shouldn't that be the first selectman's take response? Shouldn't the first selectman take responsibility? Uh, when they're arrested, they're not proven guilty. Um, However, uh, and in terms of the criminal investigation, it's still ongoing. It still hasn't gone to court yet. There's a whole lot to be done on the criminal side. We are evaluating things on the management side and taking a look at all of this. Uh, obviously, I, uh, as I said earlier, I did terminate Scott Bartlett. Uh, and we're doing a full review of what's taking place down there now. Who gave the go-ahead then to use the soil on the soccer fields? Uh, that was done by uh, DPW, and we're going back and looking at that. Again, this soil should not have been used anywhere close to ball fields or anywhere that was close to a residential use. Uh, next up, my daughter is on a soccer field that's all, that's used several times a week. She plays goalie, and that comes covered in dirt, sometimes or less, uh, on her legs. If that soil were contaminated at levels found at Gould Manor, should she be concerned? So I'll give the, the short answer first. Um, should we be concerned? No. Um, why do I say that? Um, so the reason I say that is um, while, uh, yes, um, exposure is occurring, direct contact to the soil is occurring, um, as evidenced by uh, you know, someone who is playing and getting uh, arms and legs covered with dirt. However, the concentrations of contamination at Gould Manor, we know, are low. The arsenic level and lead level is marginally above the residential uh, exposure, num uh, residential cleanup number. And I, I've talked already about how that, um, that is how we develop that number, what we think about, what our assumptions are in coming up with that cleanup number for residential. So it's not only that we assume a lot of exposure occurs, like seven days a week, young children with a lot of hand-mouth contact. There's even more protectiveness built into those numbers because when we, develop cleanup numbers, we start with looking at toxicity of the chemical, usually in animal studies, 
That's where we start out. And then in, in making the assumption that it's not animals that are being exposed, it's humans, we add multiple levels of uncertainty and protectiveness factors onto our numbers. So that what we end up with is a cleanup number that has a large margin of safety built in. So you might be wondering, well, why? Why do you set your number so low that you wouldn't even be anywhere near a level that could be a concern for an actual health symptom? And the reason for that is because we don't want to have our cleanup numbers bumping right up against an actual effect level, a, a, a level of exposure let's use lead for example, where our cleanup number for residences, residential yards for lead in soil is 400. We don't want that number to be so close to a level that could actually cause a child to be lead poisoned. We want that protectiveness because we don't want to worry when the soil level is 500 or 600 or 700 we start to worry with lead when the lead levels in soil are 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, which is what we see when there's lead paint on a house that has gotten into the soil. So that's the reason why I answer that question, no, please don't be concerned even if you know your child has a decent amount of soil exposure on a soccer field, even if those contaminants were present at levels that we know were in the soil at Gould Manor, we have such a large margin of safety built into our numbers that exposure would put someone nowhere near an effect level, a, a, an actual symptom health risk level. All right, next question. Emails from a Fairfield citizen several years ago identified the problem at Gould Manor. Why no action until the citizen reported it just a few weeks ago? Why put residents at risk for so long? Again, uh, it was my understanding that, that had been taken care of at that point, as we've identified uh, that uh, asbestos uh, issue should have been reported um, to public works, uh, to public health for public health to have identified that. We didn't mean and to put anybody at risk for any amount of time. The goal here is to make sure all of our fields, all of our parks are safe for everybody to use. Is the person placed on administrative leave still being paid? Uh, there were two people placed on administrative leave. Uh, one has been terminated, so uh, that person is no longer receiving pay. The other one on administrative leave at the moment is still receiving pay. Question. Allegation against town employees include the falsifications of records relating to the DPW yard and the berm. What is being done to investigate, audit, to determine if records relating to any other DP operations were falsified? Uh, again, allegations against the town employees. The police investigation is ongoing. So anything that relates to a criminal activity on that side is being taken care of. Uh, we've had finance go back and, and take a look at that. Uh, I've reached out to our independent auditor to bring them in to review what's taken place on the public uh, works side to make sure that any of those financial transactions and any of our internal con controls are appropriate. I believe the Board of Finance is going to do the same thing, so we're going to work together with the Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen to make sure there's a complete review uh, and that any controls that need to be enhanced or put in place are. See, I understand Parks and Rec is holding a meeting now at Penfield. What unfortunate, uh, what? Uh, what information is being shared here versus there to know how we shouldn't split up time? Why are they? Why aren't they meeting? Why one meeting? Um, 
We set these two meetings up to get information out to our residents, give folks a chance to answer questions as quickly as we could. Um, to balance that between all the other meetings that take place, we could literally take a month to set this up and that was waiting too long. I did talk to the chair of the Parks and Rec Commission to make sure uh, they knew it was gone. Uh, the director of Parks and Rec has been uh, directly involved in our discussions over the past week uh, and we've met, uh, I'm gonna say pretty much every day, we certainly met uh, again today to talk over what's taken place and to agree on closing the parks and the fields uh, that are subject to our soil testing. I had my backyard filled with soil. Will the town pay to have my soil tested? Um, not quite sure what it was filled with soil from, but uh, I think that whoever wrote that, if you can follow up with me at my office so we can find out what exactly is taking place there and, and why that would be a town issue. Do you want to? So we do have some um, on, on, the, on the list that's being further investigated. We do have a couple properties where work was done by the town um, on easements through properties. And so those, those properties are on the list. They, we are going to, uh, if it was work done by public works and placed on a property uh, that has an easement through it, um, we are going to offer testing to that resident since it was a public works project. Um, and so it, it would be up to the resident whether to accept that or not. All right. Uh, next, why do you feel important to inform the community daily rather than compiling all the records and reporting the findings, good or bad, at the end? I feel you're creating undue worry among the community. It's possible. I think that uh, the feedback I've gotten uh, by and large, is to get the information out as soon to the community, as quickly as we can. That's what we did when we were looking at the public works yard. Uh, that's what we're doing here. Uh, it seems the consensus from our communities, they'd rather hear more information sooner, have a chance to look at the information and develop their own questions uh, so that that can guide us in future actions. Why doesn't the town hire an independent testing company? Do you plan on testing all the fill that has been brought in to raise the elevation of Penfield Pavilion? Is testing of the water behind the new berm that was constructed going to be tested? Uh, one, uh, just to be clear, we do, all the testing we do is by an independent testing company. Um, the state uh, sent it out, I believe, uh, Jim, can you tell us, where, is Tyne Bond sending out to the same testing company or a different, different one? We are using a similar laboratory, um, which is a lab that's commonly used by consultants and state agencies. Uh, do you plan on testing all the fill that was brought in to raise the elevation of Penfield Pavilion? You want to take that? So Penfield Pavilion, um, the, 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 I believe the fill there was used in the parking lot that came from the fill pile. Um, so it, that is on the list uh, it, to be investigated. We're still looking at uh, the types of fill used because not all the types of fill, um, not all the types of products there were subject to being mixed in that aggregate pile. Um, and definitely, you know, most of the items weren't subject to that individual incidents, uh, incident in 2016 where that, what, that, those loads of contaminated fill were kind of set, on, set in the back of the lot. That was segregated. Nothing was mixed with that. Um, but we, the Penfield Pavilion project is on the list, uh, and we are looking at that. We're working with Tie and Bond uh, to sort of go through the list and make sure that if it needs to be tested, we'll test it. If it's a material that wasn't subject to contamination, then we can rule that off the list, and that's a part of the process that's going on now. All right. Third question on this card, is testing of the water behind the new berm that was constructed going to be tested? So the, the answer to that question is there's, there is there is and there will be a stormwater monitoring program. We're required to keep that in place. That's been going on since the operation started in 2013 and actually before that. Um, better than that, though, we will be putting in groundwater monitoring wells, which is required by the DEP as part of the solid waste closure permit, and that will give us accurate uh, information about groundwater that's coming off that site. 
Uh, next, what else was going on in town while the pile was going up and up? I think I mentioned there was also the fire, um, uh, the regional fire department training facility uh, was being built and Penfield um, project was also going on. When was the LEP hired and made part of the project? Uh, I think to some degree an LEP has been on an ongoing basis for the testing. Can somebody address that specifically? So there's a couple facets that um, were going on during the operations. First, there's always been a stormwater uh, monitoring program. So there have been monitoring the stormwater outfalls from the, at the site since I believe 2013. Um, second, uh, we, we, uh, they hired a independent LEP to kind of go in there and look at soils uh, throughout the site and collect samples on a weekly basis starting in uh, September of 2016. Um, she was the same LEP who actually observed the dumping um, that started really the, the uh, closure of the facility. Um, and there's been numerous testing done on the site throughout the years, um, including the closure of the berm. So we do have uh, a voluminous amount of information on the testing at the site. And I just add that uh, the Tyan Bond was hired the day of the initial testing done by DEP. So we were notified on a Tuesday. DEP was coming out the next day. Uh, Jim was contacted on Wednesday, and he was on site the following day consulting with us on interim controls. Uh, next, what ex expense is Fairfield going to incur from testing and remediation? Uh, we're not sure about the remediation. The initial testing that we agreed to, uh, we've agreed to an $80,000 uh, contract with Ty and Bond to get us through the testing of the first 20 sites. Uh, remediation will actually depend on what the level of remediation is and what the plan is and what the items that we are remediating will take place. We will keep everybody updated on that. Uh, what precautions is the town taking to warn all residents, especially parents. Uh, we have used every news channel we can. We've uh, sat down and talked to reporters from the Fairfield Citizen and from the Fairfield Patch. We've talked to Channel 61, Channel 8, uh, and today Channel 12. Uh, we are getting things out on emails, putting them on uh, websites. For anybody who wants updates, uh, I would ask that you go to the website and sign up for uh, news and announcements uh, so you can be kept updated too. Everything we do, we will notify that list of what's taken place. Um. How will the town recoup the funds spent on the cleanup of the contaminated sites? We are currently suing uh, Julian and we expect to prevail in that and get our money back. I would like to thank our first selectman, Mike Tetro, for acting vigorously on this horrible uh, happening in Fairfield uh, with daily emails and uh, information to the public. Secondly, I have to say that I have heard that this is being put forward by others. Whoa, well, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, just, it's a political comment. Uh, it's, uh, and uh, balances. Look, um, while I appreciate the, the intent of that, uh, there's nothing political about this. Uh, we are moving forward to make the town safe. This shouldn't have happened. We shouldn't be in this situation. That's a major violation of trust. Uh, but we are gonna get to the bottom of this. We're gonna make sure that we do that in a very public fashion and uh, we're not playing um, uh, we're, we're, this is just not a political football. We're going to make sure that we're doing what's the right thing to do for the town and do that as quickly as we can. Uh, is there an employee handbook for town employees? Yes, there is. If so, why weren't the two DPW employers fired immediately uh, when they were arrested? Uh, again, being arrested is not proof of guilt. They may, in fact, be exonerated. There are significant um, management issues uh, independent of the criminal investigation uh, that we are evaluating 
and we will take appropriate action as we go through that. Uh, most handbooks would enforce immediate dismissal for charges against the two. Uh, I don't, uh, I'll review that with our human resources department, but I don't believe, uh, at least in the companies I've worked for, uh, that uh, that may be the case. Certainly, uh, because there are allegations, um, those need to be proved out in court. However, the town is taking uh, appropriate action uh, on what I'll call the management issues involved in this. The town has so far spent 900K for remediation. How much more dollars is estimated for the new remediation park testing monitoring? Uh, in terms of pure remediation, I think that number is closer to 300,000. In terms of that, that $300,000 was spent to remove the contamination from the public works yard so that it's no longer in town and was properly disposed of. If the fields are supposed to be closed, why are kids still being allowed to play on them? And do you really think uh, one little sign is enough of a deterrent to protect them? Uh, I think we're talking about a bit more than that. Brian, do you wanna cover what we're talking about? So I know Meg talked about this. Um, we are moving forward to um, fence off areas as they become, uh, it becomes obvious that they need remediation. Um, we are gonna go out there and put signage up, just uh, letting people know. Uh, but I think Meg addressed it pretty well, to saying that the risk to the general public is very, very, very low. Um, so we're doing this out of abundance of caution. Um, you know, there's a fine line between being protective of the public and causing, um, you know, more hysteria, which we are sensitive to. Um, but in the case of Gould Manor, we understand that this is the first site that is the genesis of this issue. And we are gonna go out there and um, fence that off. It's tomorrow morning we'll be doing that. We'll be moving forward quickly with time bond to come up with a remediation plan. Um, and you know we're gonna put signage up in other areas. And I do believe that is protective of public health. Yes. Like the school district, we've officially closed the fields um, that are uh, part of uh, the sites that are being tested. Uh, so yes, we're asking everybody's cooperation in terms of um, to the extent that we can keep kids and everybody else away from that. Uh, that is what we need to do. That's why we're moving so quickly to get it tested and then moving quickly to get it rem remediated after that. We don't want this to be an extended uh, problem. Was Phil from the pile sold to any private contractors if uh, for use in non-public places? Uh, it's my understanding that uh, Julian was selling to other contractors. Uh, in fact, that was the bulk of the business. It was not uh, selling it to the town. Uh, we do not have a list of who those private contractors are. Uh, I did request from police if in their investigation uh, can they free any of that information up to us if they come across it? Uh, I was told that from a standpoint of public safety, if they do come across that, they will make that available to the uh, appropriate contractors. Uh, but it's really uh, the contractors themselves that know where they got the fill from and if they got it from Julian. Who's footing the bill for all the necessary testing that's required? Uh, simply, we're going after Julian for any of the costs associated with this that are their responsibility. It shouldn't be a cost to the Fairfield taxpayer. If we are suing Julian because of this issue, why is the town continuing to rent property from them? Ah, the Meadow Street property where the Board of Ed uh, has their uh, facilities management group, their plumbers, their electricians, uh, their carpenters, uh, that's over on Meadow Street. It's right by 95. Uh, we've been renting that facility since, I think, the early 2000s. A few years ago, Julian bought it. So we did not uh, sign, our last rent was signed with a prior owner, um, or our last lease was signed with a prior owner. Uh, when this came up, uh, it was not, uh, the Board of Selectmen did not, uh, voted not to renew this. Uh, however, uh, just 
and late breaking of fence. What we're hearing now is Julian may be in the process of selling that, so they may not be the owner of that uh, for much longer. However, in the meantime, uh, while the Board of Ed is looking at additional sites, uh, the Board of Ed function is still there. Uh, if we find another facility to go to, uh, we will make that move. Since we don't have a lease, we're kind of on a month-to-month -month basis, so we don't have to wait if we find a more appropriate facility. Uh, this is a photo. Uh, this is our backyard after heavy rains, runoff from Fairfield Woods, baseball field, floods. Our yards, uh, runoff from Fairfield Woods, baseball field, floods, our yards, leaving behind dirt and sand. As residents, what action should we be taking to protect our family and our property? Should we be seeking legal guidance? Will the town take action to remediate surrounding residential properties if tests are positive? Sands, do you want to take a look at that? And... So the Fairfield Woods baseball field, so that, that, that site was placed on the list. Um, the, um, the information given to us was that that field there was installed by um, the field contractor Tarantino, now called Diamond, um, and that when we contacted Tarantino uh, and they indicated they never used any fill from the aggregate pile purchased from Julian. Um, there is some, um, uh, some product used, there was a parking lot created right next to the ball field um, that uh, has what's called asphalt millings in it. So it looks like gravel, but it's basically from the, from the roads when they, when they um, mill a road before pa repaving. Um, that's put down and they usually put some oil in there to stabilize it, but you'll see it, it's almost like a gravel. Um, that was used, and then um, there are some plantings between the parking lot and the road that that area there did um, receive some of the suspect fill and some topsoil in there, and I believe that area was tested. And so we'll, we'll keep updating uh, people on, on that. Um, and again, the uh, Fairfield Woods soccer field uh, was one of the soccer fields that's on the list that's being tested as well. So we'll keep, keep, uh, keep you updated um, on that. So that information will be available um, uh, you know, on the website as soon as we have it in terms of the testing results. Next up, why did you move the lawsuit against Julian into arbitration when choosing that requires all information brought up to be sealed from the public? The public has a right to hear everything that's going on in the case. Uh, we moved the case to arbitration uh, because based on our attorney's recommendation, that was the, gave us the best chance of prevailing in this. It means we're going in front of a judge as opposed to potentially a jury case in that in a case that has these kind of complications, our attorneys recommended that. Uh, we have hired a court reporter to make sure that any of the um, uh, activities and conversations and proceedings are recorded uh, and making a full transcript and we're making those transcripts available to the public. So yes, the public has a right to know and we're getting that information out to the public so everybody can hear exactly what happened word for word in those arbitration hearings. Don't you believe as first selectman you had an obligation to ask your department head to have Ghoul Manor tested when you were on the email five years ago? Why didn't you ask to have it tested? Uh, simply, I didn't, um, uh, I thought it had been handled, that, that it had turned out not to be asbestos. But frankly, it should have gone uh, to the Department of Health and SANS's attention. Uh, if there was any concern that was asbestos, it shouldn't have been a decision that was made by Public Works that, uh, to uh, remediate that without approval from our health department. Where are the permits issued by DEEP to the town to build the berm? Uh, is the town going to test Pine Creek waterways and marsh? So the DEP permit was submitted in April uh, 2008 before the construction of the berm. Um, there are still some um, technical issues that we're working with the DEP. As I stated before, we're going up there to address them. Um, this isn't uncommon uh, to have a little bit of 
back and forth technical review with the DEP before they issue a final permit. I did talk to Frank Gagliardi uh, of the DEP, who is the supervisor of the waste, uh, solid waste unit, and he did confirm that uh, you know there would be no uh, disturbance of the berm as part of uh, our future actions going forward. Uh, most of what we need to discuss with them is the development of a monitoring well network and what that monitor, groundwater monitoring program is going to look like going forward. Um, this question has come up a lot, and I have a lengthy uh, bunch of questions here that I'll respond to in detail. Um, but the question is, the town going to test Pine Creek waterways and the marsh? We do have testing from uh, the surface water of Pine Creek, and we also have stormwater testing that's ongoing from the pile. It's an industrial, industrial area, um, and it requires a stormwater management permit um, from the state. Um, the, the transfer station has a stormwater mon monitoring requirement. Green Cycle has a stormwater monitoring requirement, and so does the town public works yard. So we do have information regarding the stormwater monitoring, uh, stormwater monitoring that discharges into the marsh. Everyone knows uh, that the marsh itself is built adjacent to the town landfills and is areas that have been filled dating back to the 1920s. Um, it would be um, not genuine for me to say that there may be sediments sequestered at the bottom of the marsh that are polluted. But there is no, there's no intent to disturb the marsh bottoms. Um, so there's no impact to human health. There may be impact uh, to bioaccumulation in some organisms, but the longer the material is sequestered in the marsh and is overlain, um, the less that will become. There hasn't been um, industrial long-term uh, pollution sources that have been dumping in the marsh since the 90s and you know, when, when most of the industrial areas around the marsh have really ceased. Um, so the marsh is getting cleaner. We have surface water data to express that. We do do um, surface water uh, testing. Um, but no, I would not recommend going into and doing core samples at the bottom of the marsh <coughs> unless there was some type of dredging project but um, proposed. But that is not a, necessarily a waterway that's used for nav navigable ships. So there's, no, there's nothing forcing us to dredge that material. And I would make a statement that it would actually be more harmful to the tidal marsh to go in there and go in and dredge those marsh sediments out than it would be to let them sequester in there. Um, after Hurricane uh, Sandy, the town did go in and do testing um, of the, uh, the outflow of Pine Creek Marsh. And there were uh, some minor sediments that came back uh, below threshold. Um, so if the question is, you know, are there pollutants running out of Pine Creek, it would be more in the surface water than it would be in the sediments. And again, we do do testing um, of surface water in that area. Uh, please supply the public with a full list of sites where soil from the pile was used. Uh, we've gotten 20 sites out. We're still going through matching invoices with public works tickets. We will make all those sites available for the public. Sands, do you want to add anything, anything to that? Yeah, I would just add, we're, you know, that's what we're working on, and we've actually uh, are engaging tie and bond in this process so that we are, we are certain that, uh, you know, uh, that we can confirm that a product that came from a, a suspect product from the Julian aggregate fill pile or any of their products that came out there did go to a particular site, that we have the location of where that was used on the site, how much was used, um, and, and that, takes, that takes some time. So we have all the invoices, uh, we've, we've been going through those, but now we, want, uh, we need to sort of hammer down on the detail on some of that so uh, that all those things will, will be coming out. Uh, we, have, we have a list, we're, we're adding to it even by uh, just anybody who, we get emails and calls of people saying this happened here, they filled my, my, behind my curbs here, we add it to the list. Now we have to go back and verify find an invoice that was issued around that time to say yes there was fill that came out that was for that project uh, so we know that was 
that fill. Um, and so that's the detail of the process that we're going on. But we also want independent third-party confirmation that we're not missing anything uh, as we go through this list. So the, 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 the first 20 were relatively easy. We had verbal confirmation of annual maintenance of soccer fields, both by DPW, some by Tarantino, um, and that they said, yes, we used uh, suspect products in, the, in those areas. And so that's why we're moving forward with that 20 relatively quickly. Uh, and then we'll continue to work as fast as we can on the, the remainder of the list. Uh, next up, uh, does the first selectman have any responsibility for the actions taken by town employees? Absolutely. The buck stops here. That's why I'm going back first, making sure that we're getting every park and ball field tested, uh, remediated, made safe for our employees. And second, going back, looking at what allowed this to happen and making sure we tighten up the appropriate control so this never happens again. What test method is being used for the continuation, con contamination analysis? Can you describe the test process in layman's terms? Who would like to take that? The, the, um, the parameters that we test for are based on the types of um, contaminants that were detected at the, at the Julian Materials Yard. Um, and we, we looked at that information, and the major contaminants that were found there were, were uh, asbestos, kind of in the order of toxicities, asbestos, PCBs, lead, and petroleum compounds. Um, and um, let me correct myself. There was no, there was no asbestos uh, detected. It was suspected it was tested there. It was suspected it was found there. Um, so those, those are the constituents, constituents we're looking for in the fill that was reportedly used at the site. Um, and was the second one? Can you uh, describe these in layman's terms? Yeah, the, the, the PCBs could have originated by several sources. Um, they're used in oils and electrical transformers. Um, those, the PCBs themselves were banned in the 1980s. Uh, they were also used in uh, paints on, on buildings. So if the Julian Yard was handling various painted materials, the PCBs could have came out of the paint. Uh, similarly with, with lead, um, uh, they could have came out of the various painted building materials. Um, the asbestos, if there was building materials brought there with asbestos, then they could have originated from there as well. Um, the petroleum compounds um, primarily probably originated from asphalt. I mean, asphalt is pretty much pure petroleum. Um, and, um, you know, if you, if you go along any road in Connecticut and you, you test the soil alongside the road, you're going to find petroleum compounds. And um, there, there are some definitions out there in the regulatory realm that define, you know, asphalt as clean fill. Um, and sometimes it depends on the percentages or, or the size of the petroleum, whether they're, they're, they're millions or cobble sizes. So um, as we move forward and evaluate the sites, we, if there's asphalt found, we're just going to have to look on where that's used, was it used appropriately, appropriately and can it stay in place and be managed. So when this began, we found the dumped demolition material that did contain PCBs, um, lead, and we are concerned about asbestos. Uh, that's really w um, what's driving the investigation, those types of materials. Um, everything that was brought into the pile should have been clean, recyclable material, meaning that if, if you had a foundation and it was concrete, um, concrete block, that would be clean as long as it was tested and made sure there was no paints um, that would have lead, you know, lead associated with it. Same thing with PCBs. PCBs are building, sometimes in building materials. That's why when I went up there um, on December 13th and saw the demolition um, that had been deposited on site and we had the testing of PCBs associated with that, that was a major concern and that's why basically immediately shut the site, covered the pile and began to address the issue of remediation um, and testing and the whole process. So um, we have a lot of data that's been collected from the pile through the closure of the berm, through the LEP testing between September and December. And during that time, there was only low levels of uh, materials found in that other than during 
the remediation during what was the focus of the dump illegal dumping and the remediation that took place in February uh, 2017. Thank you. Next, good evening. Could you please tell us the uh, anticipated date upon which testing results will be received? Is there a mitigation plan in place uh, in the event of contamination uh, are found at high levels? Yeah, so we, again, we've posted and we've received various testing results from the DEP testing, the secondary request for the mass analysis of the DEP retesting, the tie and bond testing results, um, and then coming as early as potentially this Friday, we may have some of the initial tests for the schools. Early next week, we should have uh, the remainder of the priority site testing results available. They'll be up on the website. Um, and uh, yes, there is a, you know, there's a, there's a plan in, we have a hired somebody, tie and bond, to plan out any needed mitigation, remediation plans to work with the state, DEP, to get all the necessary approvals before we do any kind of work, um, uh, but that's that's all in place. Thank you. Uh, can you explain the uh, where the soil samples are taken on the fields? Is it random sampling locations, or do you have special locations? DPW use fill on on each field. Uh, also, it uh, extensive fill was placed by goals on a soccer field but no sample has taken from that area on the field years later. Are you confident you are getting an accurate picture of possible contaminants? Uh, Sands or Jim? Yes, we met with DPW as I explained earlier, and I personally visited all the, the lo prior year locations of the schools. Um, for the most part, the fill was used um, in front of the goalies where a lot of the wear and tear happens along the center line of the field. So that's where we're concentrating our sampling. We're generally doing right now is the, as part of the expedited environmental screening, um, three samples, like one in front, of, in front of each goal and one in the center of the field. However, we, if we do see the need to have a couple more, we, we're collecting them right now. I'll just add to that is that, you know, we, we based it upon conversations, numerous conversations with public works employees to say, what did you do at that field? And they, over and over again, it was the typical thing is remove the sod in the goalie area. That's the area that tends to get beat up the most. Um, remove the sod, level out what's there. If they needed more fill, they would bring it in. They would either roll sod out and cover it with a little topsoil um, and um, or plant grass seed if it was off season. So that was... That was the information given to us, uh, confirmed with Public Works. Uh, they met with Public Works who reconfirmed that, um, and that's guiding the testing. Uh, did, first, did the first student bus yard at One Route Highway re receive, receive fill from the uh, reclamation yard aggregate pile uh, from the Public Works yard between 2013 and 2016? when potholes were filled and when the DPW employees parking area that is used by first student and DPW employees and Fairfield Public School Department of Transportation employees uh, was resurfaced. This area houses the Fair, uh, Fairfield first student fleet and 200 plus employees walk through uh, and work in these areas. Uh, I live in Fairfield and these areas, uh, will these areas be tested? And if so, until then, is it safe to be working there? So we did have discussions with Public Works about, we received this, this same complaint, uh, not complaint, but uh, alert to the work that went on at the uh, bus yard. We did uh, ask Public Works, how would you repair the potholes over the, over the years during that time? And they said, you know, we would use the asphalt millings, which is, a, which is the standard type of repair, fill in those potholes, put um, a, uh, a binding agent on it, which is, uh, Hot asphalt would do it and bind it just like they would in any other street uh, in town, how they would repair a pothole. Um, regarding there is uh, testing that, uh, air testing to, in terms of is the bus yard safe? Um, there was um, during, you know, so the best representation we have of what may have happened during that time is what was left on site uh, after Julian left. Uh, of what was there, they, that, uh, of that 
100,000 cubic yards, 40%, that's way more than random sampling at distance, but 40% of that fill was tested in the construction of the berm yard, uh, the berm. And while that construction was going on, during, during on three separate days, uh, at five separate locations, um, testing uh, six different uh, constituents, uh, doing air sampling on the downwind side of that site, found no, nothing detected in any of the air samples for those parameters, for petroleum hydrocarbons, for asbestos, for, um, you know, uh, PCBs. Um, there was a couple of different parameters there that I'm not recalling off the top of my head, but they did air testing during earth moving activities with the materials that were in question that would have been uh, our best representation of what may have been similar in that yard at the time um, uh, when they were actively moving uh, those materials around. Uh, so we do have a, an a, a relatively accurate picture of, of, of the risks there and at least with those samples, nothing was found in those samples that was on the downwind side of the yard and the potholes were repaired in the way that potholes throughout town are repaired. Thank you. Uh, several times this evening, the statement has been made, this never should have happened. Are you asserting at this time that DPW staff absolutely knew contaminated soil was being dumped at the pile and then reused around town? No. What I'm saying is that material in the pile was construction aggregate, uh, an aggregate material uh, that's appropriate for certain construction uses, but should not have been used on ball fields and parks when a topsoil application what was appropriate and something that met the residential standards as we heard here is the appropriate standard to use, not an industrial commercial standard. It doesn't have to do with the con contamination so much as the quality of the soil and the materials in it and what the expectation is. It's using the right soil, the right material, the right aggregate for the proper uh, application. I am a parent coach who spends a lot of time on the soccer fields. This past spring, I noticed an increase in kids having breathing problems. Currently, my own daughter, who never had breathing problems in the past, is on four inhalers. And when I took her to the doctor, her lungs were only functioning at 68%. How can I find out if her new condition is connected to contaminated soil? So the, the contaminants that have been mentioned in discussions about the DPW soil pile and the testing results that we have now from the Gould Manor Park, none of those chemicals would cause those symptoms that were described. Um, so it is virtually impossible for contact with soil on the fields to cause symptoms like that. Next, in 2016, it was discovered that there was questionable material. So why weren't sites it was used at tested then? 2016, we identified the PCBs and lead uh, that had been brought in two weeks earlier into the pile. Uh, we tested that and removed all that material from the town of Fairfield, from the pile site. Uh, it was not disclosed at that time by um, DPW that material from the pile had been used in ball fields and parks around town. If it had, we would have started this testing much sooner. Can an outside third party come in to audit the bonds? How, uh, how much will this cost taxpayers? Uh, we, our purchasing department has gone through and confirmed that the bonds are valid. Uh, that is something they can do. Uh, we will, I uh, have asked our independent auditor, who's an, our outside independent auditor, uh, to come in and review the situation and see what recommendations they would make uh, to enhance this. Did the first selectman know that Scott Bartlett's son worked for Julian? If so, was the considered a conflict? My understanding is that Julian did not disclose this on the RFP response submission. 
Uh, our RFP uh, response asks if anybody, um, any uh, family member of a town official or um, any, I think any employee at States uh, works with a contractor that was not disclosed as part of the response on the RFP. Uh, I did become aware that uh, certainly uh, Scott's uh, Bartlett's son works part-time for, uh, I think, one of the landscaping functions in Julian, not in Fairfield. I'm not sure when that happened, either before or after they signed up. Um, so, but uh, certainly uh, Mr. Bartlett knew when that happened, and Julian did, and we're going back trying to confirm when that took place. Brian, do you have the, the rest of those cards? Okay, if you want to take them, go ahead and take them. So I kind of, uh, since I was divvying up the cards, I kind of took the ones that were germane. Is the town taking measures to ensure these chemicals are not found in the city water or the water found on contaminated sites? So th this, uh, this type of fill material would not pose a threat um, for the public uh, water supply system. Um, all the areas are in areas where uh, there are no groundwater wells, um, and basically city water is provided by Aquarian. Um, even if there were uh, groundwater wells, it's very shallow, thinly deposited um, soil that's ranging in, you know, a, about a foot deep in most cases, so there, there would not be any impacts to the uh, public's, public supply, drinking water supply. Why are we not testing other outdoor areas adjacent to where the chemicals were found? Assumption being these chemicals can move from the rain. Um, we are testing um, areas. Uh, we will continue to do stormwater monitoring around the pile. Um, and we are testing and delineating the degree and extent of where the fill is found um, in each of the sites. How are the test results released that is on a pass-fail basis or a measure or a measure of an amount of chemical found. Um, so we have a time bond. Uh, we'll get the results from Phoenix Lab. We've placed a lot of that laboratory data on the website. We understand that's hard to deduce. Um, time bond is actually uh, going through a QA, QC process, and then they'll put that into charts that basically show uh, the level of contaminant comparing it to um, the standards. Um, so it will be much more easily understood um, by the public. They'll also generate maps showing where the particular tests were located and then have the standard, have the actual results of the, the chemical analysis if it exceeds standards. So that will be put into a, uh, into a format that will be easily uh, understood by the public. Why isn't the January 10th, 2019 Osprey environmental memo and report that references chemical characterizations in the berm posted on the website? Um, I will make that, I will post that on the website. Um, I have copies, I can email that to you. It was in a draft format that was submitted to the DEP. Um, so there is some back and forth um, discussions going on there, but we hope to have all those outstanding permit issues resolved shortly. Um, the January 31st report isn't posted either. Again, that can be posted. All the material, all of the uh, data and material that was generated during the construction of the berm is on the Public Works website. Um, and we had numerous public meetings, the town had numerous public meetings discussing that process. Um, has the DEP approved the application that was submitted April 12, 2008? Again, we have a meeting with them um, and we hope to get that permit issued as soon as possible, get the groundwater monitoring wells and start that process. Health risk aside, how much damage are we expecting to the overall environment of our parks? I'm worried about the contaminants leaching into the groundwater over time. Um, I haven't seen anything in the uh, data analysis that would suggest that there would be any type of long-term impacts to groundwater. Again, most of the areas where the fill is located is in what is called a GB groundwater area, um, which is not suitable for direct human consumption, meaning you wouldn't be able to install a well into those areas and all those areas are supplied by um, city water. Um, so there's no worry about direct ingestion um, from any type of leaching materials in a park into, the, uh, in, into water that would be consumed directly. 
Um, why do we not notify the EPA, OSHA, and the federal government? We have notified DEP numerous times. They were notified uh, during the remediation. I have uh, volumes of uh, back and forth with uh, the PCB division during the initial remediation. Um, same thing with the solid waste uh, closure with the berm. Um, I will tell you the truth, EPA uh, was uh, basically contacted by DEP during the initial um, remediation um, in February 2017. This really doesn't rise to something that they would uh, necessarily respond to. Uh, this one might be good for Sam's. What doctors have been consulted on what we should be looking for in our children, AKA symptoms? What about the water in Gould Manor? Uh, who is chasing the environmental Who is choosing the environmental firm? Uh, we are no longer, since we no longer trust the team to choose. Um, Gould, Manor, Gould Manor Park specific, has the rest of the park been tested? Is it just the sidewalk? Why will it, why will it, why is it still open? Uh, what precautions should be taken with our children? Can exposure come from touch? So, um, we can answer a little bit in terms of the, the doctors monitoring, you know, doctors are required uh, to test for lead at certain points in, in uh, a child's, uh, um, in the childhood uh, at different points. So that's really the predominant one that we'd be looking for that we are, that, it's, that is all ongoing all the time. Um, um, so the, um, you know, in choosing the environmental firm, you know, we, you know, uh, almost from 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 the day uh, day the testing was done on Wednesday, I met with the purchasing director about selecting an environmental firm. Uh, you know, because of the need for expediency, uh, the he produced the state bid list, and a contractor was chosen off the state bid list, which is you know firms that have already been gone out to bid and and been approved by the state that towns can use an immediate basis. Um, so that's how that was done. Um, with the the rest of the sidewalk, uh, the rest of the park hasn't been tested because we don't have any data to suggest that any fill from Julian was placed there. Uh, the ballparks were con the two ballparks were constructed prior to Julian's involvement in the fill pile, uh, and those ballparks were constructed by Tarantino. Uh, and Tarantino has said they've never purchased anything from Julian. Uh, but even then, those were those ballparks were built prior to uh, Julian's involvement in the fill pile, um, and then uh, in terms of what per precautions are being taken, you know. So at this point, you know, we've, we're following the state recommendations and we're going beyond them. We're we're partitioning areas off. The sidewalk itself is 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 a, a perfect. If, if grass is sufficient. You know, as you heard, grass in most cases is sufficient to prevent dermal contact. Uh, the sidewalk is certainly sufficient to prevent dermal contact with anything under it. Um, and most of the um, constituents that we're talking about don't have a dermal pathway, dermal uh, exposure pathway. You know, you get lead, unless it's a specific type of lead, uh, tetraethyl lead that's used uh, in some applications, a liquid lead, that has a dermal exposure, but the lead that we're talking about from lead paint and lead con in construction activities doesn't have a dermal exposure pathway. You have to ingest it. And same thing with the uh, arsenic, it has to be ingested through drinking or through, in, in, you know, ingestion of the material. Um, and then I guess I can ask Brian maybe to respond to the, what about the water in Gould Manor? I'm sorry, I'm just reading the one. So stormwater in the town, um, we know that there's, we have a project to go in and actually dredge Gould Manor Pond um, in the near future. We're actually working uh, through that. Um, there are low level pollutants in the sediments of the pond that are associated with stormwater. 
Um, you know, we do live in an urban environment and stormwater does tend to carry um, low level pollutants off of the roads, which is similar to, um, you know, the types of fill materials we'll see. So that will be, um, you know, there will be dredging that will we'll need to get rid of that material at a um, regulated facility. That being said, um, those materials are basically generally not found in surface water. Um, you know, if we were to have a spill or something like that uh, adjacent to the property where we would have, um, let's say, an oil truck or something turnover, we would be out there immediately addressing that matter and taking samples and being protective of, of the environment. But right now, there's no indication that there's any issue um, with, with chemical pollutants in any of the surface water. Uh, October 2016, the bond with Julian was discovered to be fraudulent. Uh, the 2018, the town uh, what? 2018, the town indicated uh, 41 uh, inconsistencies in DPW reporting and numerous other, uh, why were these red flags ignored? Um, one, I don't, I, I would say they weren't ignored. And in terms of the bond, we immediately went through and changed our procedures to make sure that never happened again. And that we confirmed that all other bonds in place for the town. In terms of the 41 inaccuracies in DPW reporting, I think that's referring to one of the affidavits and a spreadsheet. Uh, that was prepared, and I believe that was uh, completely reviewed and audited by our internal auditor to identify exactly uh, what those were and what those amounted to, and that was done by our finance department. And uh, so again, I'm going to suggest that that wasn't ignored. Uh, where are the second and third selectmen? Um, they are, uh, we've been keeping them fully updated. Uh, along with everybody else in town, we're moving as quickly as we can uh, to get our uh, announcements out, our information out, share that with the town. That's why tonight is on FAIR TV to make sure everybody, whether they can make tonight's meeting or not, uh, are able to participate in this. Given the complicated nature of the series of events um, and the egregious breach of public trust we've all experienced. I'm questioning if the town needs state or federal oversight to manage the process and remediation plan. Can you share any details that would help the public feel more confident in your ability to execute the proposed protocol with over, without oversight? What measures will you take to ensure this process is not compromised? And it was in the Julian area. Well, first of all, um, I've been managing the remediation of the site since 2016. Um, I'm a lifelong town resident. I feel I'm more than qualified uh, to make sure that this process is, the integrity is kept in this process. Um, I, you know, nothing but uh, um, hope that, you know, this, this will be uh, solved and, and completed quickly. Uh, we've also, you know, Time Bond is really the best consultant for the job. Um, they've had a history of dealing with these complicated matters. Um, and we have reached out to state and federal uh, officials numerous times throughout this process for their input. Um, sometimes they've assisted and sometimes they haven't, but we will continue to reach out to them um, if and when it rises to the point where they need to be involved. I would also point out that on all the news releases and all the test results that we're posting in Fairfield for everybody, we're copy, uh, copying uh, members of DEEP and the Department of Health on that, so they see all the information that we're uh, developing. And, and just for example, like we've had conference calls with DPH to, to essentially ask the questions, is there anything else we should be doing? Are we missing anything? We've had those similar conference calls with DEP to say, is there anything else you want us to do? And, and these agencies, in many cases, are going to be signing off on the permits to do this, this activity that we're moving forward to do. Uh, so if, if a remediation needs to be done, depending on the appropriate agency, either DPH or DEP, will be signing off on these types of activities. You mentioned the material should never have been used for the ball fields. How does fill get purchased? 
Um, right now, um, obviously, we do not purchase any fill or use any fill from the pile. We haven't done so since uh, December 2016. Um, as the interim director of public works, I am evaluating all of our purchasing uh, procedures. We do have an existing materials bid um, with, with many contractors. Uh, you know, we'll have to see uh, what information they are giving us. Uh, generally, towns don't require uh, chemical constituents before purchasing fill material. It's assumed to be clean. Um, maybe we'll need to put some type of protocol in place to make sure that the fill that is being delivered to the town is clean and does meet the definition of clean fill. Those are the types of protocols we could put in place. Who should have looked at the material and isn't there a purchasing process, an inspection process, um, and what work is being done? Again, at the time, uh, you know, we assumed all the material was clean coming out of the pile until uh, it was determined um, in 2016 that it was there was some issues. Uh, but again, any material, there's no more material coming out of the pile. And again, we'll look at our purchasing procurement and uh, see see what's happening. Could you please clarify the use of the word clean? Because uh, I believe it's up to commercial industrial standards, not for residential standards. So when I mean clean fill, I mean that it does, we would never put anything in a park or any town property that was above the RSR direct exposure criteria. Um, industrial criteria is only in areas where you would put a land use restriction or the landfill. That material can't be used on schools or residential properties. Um, so anything, uh, any material we put in town would need to be clean um, before placing it. Sorry. What is the cumulative tonnage of fill at the pile? I don't know the exact tonnage, um, but there is 100,000 cubic yards of material up there. That was determined by our surveyor um, by doing surveys of the pile. Uh, when did the testing of the fill put to file determine the high and proper levels that the fill was used after the date, when, why, where? Um, basically, again, uh, the issue really came to light when the illegal dumping was determined, was discovered, and. December 13th, 2016. Um, nothing has been taken out of the site other than for the remediation waste since that day. We closed uh, the fill pile in December. When did you first know about the contaminated soil? When did I first know? Um, when Joe Michelangelo came up to my office in December 13th, 2016 and said, I think there's a problem. Can you come up, come up and basically advise me uh, what the best course of action is? That's basically what started this. Please tell us about the approvals of the berm by the DEP. We've talked about this. Um, I am going up there in the next week or so to have discussions with the solid waste um, supervisor to discuss what it, what's necessarily what's necessary um, on the punch list to have this uh, permit issued. Um, we do have some agreement with them that no further earthwork is required up there. Uh, we just need to really install monitoring wells and um, then we should see the permit be issued. Um, and this, uh, the soil analysis dates for the material in the berm. Again, those have been posted online since the construction of the berm process. That's all been public information. Um, I believe Joe, is, Joe Michelangelo is holding public information sessions during and before the berm construction. Um, and what is the current status of the berm? It's vegetated, um, the site is locked, um, there's no access to the public. Um, once the berm is vegetated, there should be no stormwater issues associated with it. It will go into a long-term groundwater monitoring program, and at this point, it's just gonna be, it's gonna be fallow for the time being. Why was the fill not tested before it was placed on fill and used throughout the town? Um, so after a meeting with Osprey Environmental this morning, um, he basically said there was a testing program in place uh, for the beneficial reuse of, uh, of catch basin waste and street sweepings, which is allowed under the DEP protocol. I have to get that information and really determine um, what that program consisted of. Um, and uh, that should be forthcoming. Um, how will we pay for the testing and remediation? First step is we're gonna get the uh testing done, um, and then based on the amount of remediation, uh, what takes place, 
uh, we'll sit down with our finance department and put together a financial plan uh, that makes sure we get that done. We will get the testing done and we will get the remediation done. Uh, last question, moving forward, will material from the DPW yard still be used around town? No, has not been used since December 2006. Uh, 16, I'm sorry. <laughs> if so, will, will you be testing, pro will there be a testing protocol and how will any material leaving the yard be documented? Um, so right now, uh, like I said, the site will be left fallow until we're positive, um, until the DEP permit is issued. That's one of the things we're gonna discuss is there is excess fill outside of the berm and any decision to move that material will include testing, um, but we have to determine whether there's any cost benefit ratio of uh, looking at that material, testing that material, and seeing if there is a proper reuse for that material. At this moment, that's all on hold, so I would say there's nothing coming in or going out of that uh, pile until we get a handle on the situation. So I, 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 I dealt, I uh, addressed some of this, but I'll go into this in greater detail. I, this could be a master class um, uh, in discussion about the creek. Um, why isn't the bottom of Pine Creek being tested? Pollution tends to sink to the bottom. Uh, yes, metals and PCBs and in inorganic materials tend to sink to the bottom. VOCs and petroleum products float on the surface in most cases. Um, we do have testing of the surface waters. Um, I'm not saying that there's not impacts to the marsh to try to say that they're from uh, this individual pile or from the historical landfill would be next to uh, impossible. Um, again, there's also been surface water discharges into the marsh. Um, most marshes in the state of Connecticut are not just tidal, but they're also receiving, water, receiving bodies from upland areas. Um, they're also areas that have been filled historically um, because they were seen as a malaria source and just area wastelands that we could be filled. Um, you know, the siting of the landfill adjacent to the marsh in the 30s and 40s was not the best decision, but that's what was done in the, back in those days. And to try to uh, kind of put that genie back in the bottle is almost impossible. Um, all coastal towns in the state of Connecticut have generally sited their uh, towns, landfills, and the marsh, again, because they were seen as unusable areas that were meant to be filled and killed and filled with waste. So, yes, there may be uh, materials that are in the bottom sediments of the marsh, um, but in my professional uh, opinion and in my experience, um, to go in there and dredge that uh, area uh, would be more detrimental to the health of the marsh than it would be to um, let those uh, sediments sequester in place. Um, there's great debate about that. Um, and most of the time, uh, dredging projects are put on hold uh, for long periods of time um, because they're very costly and the disposal of those types of uh, sediments um, are multi-jurisdictional and basically you need cap cover to dredge an area and then move it out to Long Island Sound and basically dump it on the bottom and cover it with clean material. So you'd be taking the issue from the marsh and depositing in the sound. Um, and since, like I said, um, the upper areas of the marsh that are adjacent to the landfill are, are not really largely navigable waterways, the benefits of that would be negligible and, in my opinion, more impactful to the environment than addressing the issue. Not to mention, there are still stormwater sources that enter into the marsh from downtown and adjacent um, areas that, you know, you'll see this type of sedimentation occur again and again as, an, as a, you know, anthropological process. Um, so, no. Uh, it, could you test the bottom of the marsh? Yes. Are there probably some levels of pollutants in the bottom of the marsh? I would say yes. Does it make sense to go in there and remediate that? And is there any health impact to that? I would say no. Uh, these possible pollutants affects the chain of life that begins in the marsh and the waters of Pine Creek and the bathing at South Pine Creek Beach and in Saskatoon Beach, as well as the private waterfront properties at Bunning Pine Creek. Again, 
Um, I mean, we have surface water to data to show that there is no um, surface water pollution occurring um, in the marsh. Um, you know, after big storms, if we go down there and test the stormwater outfalls, which has been done, um, there's low levels of petroleums that generally leach from the uplands, um, which would be commonplace. Um, really, the impacts to surface waters uh, that are more concerning to human health are of uh, basically runoff from um, runoff from you know E. coli, fecal coliform type waste, which is something that we'd be more ep more likely to encounter if by swimming or or touching the water in the marsh, and those are driven again by storm water and um, you know geese uh, runoff from you know, sewage type of sources, um, old septic systems, but we've been addressing those issues. Um, plant upgrade has addressed a lot of those issues. So the water quality is, surface water quality in the marsh is improving and we have data to support that. The, the pollutants are heavier than water and settle out quickly, but can be moved by strong currents. And even if not moving still affect marine life in the Pine Creek, a breeding ground for fish. Again. The longer the marsh sediments are there, the more they become sequestered by inputs to, into the marsh. Um, again, the, the landfills have been there since the 40s, so there's probably some level of sediment um, pollution there, but to go in there and dredge that up um, is, not, is not, right now would not be prudent. And then this is a question, why is our first selectman only doing what the DEP tells him to do? I've been a consultant for numerous towns. I've been working in numerous towns. I don't know any town or jurisdiction that goes out and starts testing bottom sediments of all of their surface waters or Long Island Sound without some type of consent order or notice of violation um, from, a, from a federal or state agency. Um, you know, it, all up and down the Connecticut coast, unfortunately, uh, the state has been industrialized from, you know, very early on, 1700s. Um, all of the marshes, when you drive around, you can see the impacts that occur to them. Again, they've all been filled. And, um, you know, to say that um, it, no one knows that this marsh has been impacted by fill um, would be a little bit naive. I'm acknowledging that. Um, but it... it, it to the taxpayer, it doesn't make sense based on the relative risk to go out there and say, we need to dredge the entire bottom of South Pine Creek. It doesn't make fiscal sense based on the risk associated with that. Any further comments from the panel? I just wanted to say, I, I know um, sometimes people have um, health questions that they're thinking about, worried about, that they don't necessarily feel comfortable asking in a public setting. So um, I do, I have cards with my contact information. Um, please don't hesitate to grab one, give me a call, send me an email um, if you have any questions that are still lingering or if things occur to you after this meeting, um, I'm happy to uh, discuss any of those with you. All right, thank you. Um, it's been two and a half hours, roughly. Uh, I want to point out that going forward, to keep up to date, uh, we're going to, uh, this is on FAIR TV, and I believe tomorrow uh, evening's public session will also be on FAIR TV. Uh, we're going to have frequent updates in the news media. Uh, we're going to use the news and announcements section of our webpage. So if you want to sign up for that, that way you don't have to check back. You will get an email directly from the town uh, website. We have a web page, as we've identified, set up directly for this to collect all the relevant information. We'll also be making posts on our Facebook page. The goal is to be completely transparent as we go through this process and keep everybody updated as to where we are, what we're finding out, and what the next steps are. Uh, I want to thank our panel. Uh, Ms. Harvey, I want to thank you for making the trek down here. Uh, Mr. Cleary, uh, Mr. Carey, thank you for joining us here tonight. Mr. Olson, thank you for uh, representing Ty and Bond here and, and your work on this project. 
Uh, thank you all very much for uh, sitting through all this and joining us tonight.